time to, um, to join us. Um, a few things just to say um, at the outset. So these uh, oral evidence sessions are being recorded um, and it is the intention for them to be uh, streamed live, although possibly not directly, on a YouTube channel to the college. So this will be viewable by the public. And indeed, uh, if and when they are streamed live, there will be an opportunity for viewers to ask questions of the witnesses as well, um, if any of the witnesses um, are able to answer those questions. If therefore there is anything uh, confidential, either commercially or scientifically sensitive, obviously we would ask you not to, uh, to put that in the public domain, but perhaps you could let us know by email at a later stage. Um, uh, we're going to try and keep very strictly for time, and I apologise that we're slightly late starting, um, so we will aim to finish this, uh, this session at 11.15. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do, if you wouldn't mind, is just to introduce yourself in terms of, uh, of where you're currently working, and then give us um, just a few minutes uh, of your thoughts about the future of surgery and surgical care uh, with your obvious expertise behind that um, and if there are particular points that you would illustrate on the way through that. And what I'm going to do is ask the commissioners to engage with you with a series of questions um, but this isn't going to be I hope restricts in any way. I want it to be a free-ranging discussion more than a, a strict sort of question-and-answer session. Um, if there's any issues of concern on the way through that, please bring that to our attention. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs> Not at all. Second with you. So, uh, first of all, if you would be so kind of just to outline yourself and your thoughts on this, the future of surgery and surgical care. So I'm, I'm Nick Ware. I'm the director of the Medical Research Council Epidemiology Unit at the University of Cambridge, where I am also co-director of the Institute of Metabolic Science. Um, I have a number of other hats. So I am uh, a public health physician, and my research is um, uh, in to uh, understanding the etiology of diabetes, obesity, and related metabolic disorders but also the translation of that understanding into uh, preventive action, both at the individual level and probably more importantly at the wider societal level. So I also head up something called CEDA, which is funded by UKCRC. It's a <coughs> centre of diet and physical activity research, predominantly aimed at uh, understanding determinants at the population level uh, and uh, the evaluation of interventions that impact on whole populations. Um, I also still uh, see patients in the diabetes clinic as a diabetologist. So I've, I think I'm, I have an unusual career in that it spans from the molecular and the individual clin clinical patient right through to, to whole populations and, and, and prevention. And um, I have to confess I have never thought about what are the implications of what I do and what I study for the future of surgery until I got your request to come. And um, my initial reaction was that I didn't have anything to say on the topic. Um, but having reflected on it, I think that's possibly wrong, actually. And no, that, otherwise, otherwise it wouldn't have come, actually. Uh, and I, I think the, where, where I think is inc incredibly interesting, and it's, it's probably timely that, um, that I'm here today, is I, I'm, I wasn't part of it, but I heard on the news that were coming down about the Academy of Medical Sciences report on multi-morbidity. And clearly, to my mind, the big future healthcare challenge is you know, the, the aging of the population and the, the increase in multiple morbidity in older people. And at one level, that's portrayed as a, a problem. Uh, and we can get into the, the nuances of this. Uh, but actually, my supposition is that probably what we're going to see in the future um, is 
sort of a paradox is that, that, that people will be living, into, living to a, a, a greater age, but they will have more medical conditions in a broad sense. But those medical conditions won't potentially be uh, cured, but they'll be uh, dealt with and tolerated such that they don't die, but they are prevalent. So people will go into old age living with more things, but I would anticipate, given uh, the way medical care, uh, treatment, and technology is going, that actually they will, the, the trend will be that those people will be living better able to function into older age. So, so we will uh, be seeing a, 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 an older population who are healthier in the sense of functional capability, but have a lot more con conditions. And I think that does have implications for surgery, because obviously there are many things that those people will have that are um, uh, associated with those medical conditions and, and potentially their treatment. But also, I think a, a potentially active elderly population who are already in touch with medical care m probably won't tolerate not being able to get their hips fixed and get things like that. They will they will probably be more demanding of things that can maintain their functional capability. So, uh, yeah, we can expand on that, but that would be my central uh, supposition of what's likely to happen. Okay, that, that's interesting. And obviously, it's also um, the, the issue about no age restriction is very pertinent, given that the Duke of Edinburgh has just had his hip done at the age of... 96, I think it was. Can I just come back? So, um, sure. in terms of just uh, trying to set the scene here a little bit, the the whole issue about uh, population and disease demographics is yeah. basically going to be the very sort of first area that the commission comments on because it does set the scene for everything that happens there afterwards. So given that the Commission is about looking at what surgery is going to look like in 5, 10, 20 years time and how we're going to train surgeons to provide uh, surgical care in those time points, I think there's, there's some very basic things that we need to just have straight in our minds about the population demographics and the disease burden. Uh, the first of which, obviously, is is what's the population going to look like in, in 5, 10, 20 years' time? What's the age profile of the population going to look like in 5, 10 years? So, <laughs> so there's 65 million people now living in the UK, and by 2039, there's going to be 74 million. So the population is going to get bigger. So that's obviously impacts on surgery per se. But in terms of demographics, you know, the, the, the proportion of people over 65 is really shooting up. So in 1976, it was 14.2. 2016 is 18, but by 2036, it will be 23.9. So it's a bigger proportion of a bigger population. And I guess the other relevant phenomenon to how we plan and configure surgery is where those people will be living. Because um, my understanding is, in general, cities don't age as time goes, as, as, as you move through secular periods. So essentially, people living in London live there for a bit, and then a new wave of young people come in. So as the population ages, probably London won't age. But places like rural Norfolk and the coastal areas will age considerably. So I think that has implications for how we plan healthcare services because we might be looking at a greater proportion of elderly people living quite a long way from major cities. Do you think that, um, that, that possibly that there's going to be more movement of people in years to come? So. Could you envisage a, a situation where people in their 50s and 60s may move out of urban conurbations into Norfolk or wherever, sure. but in their 70s and 80s, with an increasing <coughs> disease burden, can move back in. 
they're going to move back into maybe not London, but they'll come into Norwich <coughs> or somewhere like that. No, I, I think that that is likely. I'm gonna, you know, I'm basing this on things like ONS project, projections of, of the, the future, and um, you know, obviously there are seismic things that can happen that can affect total population size, which are beyond our control, you know, you know, politics, etc. So, um, yeah, yeah. but I, but I think you're you're right. The, probably the there there'll be much more dynamic movement of 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 people across their life course. I don't think people will, you know, do what former generations did, stay in one place and, and you know, from from birth to death. They're much more mobile. All right, next. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would I. I Put a different, and I understand the the, the uh, vision you're putting of that. But I would, th I think probably the major driver is going to be house prices, and what we're starting to see is actually with the higher high high property prices in urban areas that it's the 20, 30 somethings who are starting to move out to the cheap housing coastal areas. I'm certainly seeing that in London. It may be different in um, sort of Norwich, Norfolk. So I'm not sure that that demographic move and once you're out there very difficult to move back in so uh, w it's it just shows just how uncertain it's got all this all yeah, this yeah, is um but i think nick is you, it's probably a reasonable supposition to question whether the future is you know everything has to be uh, centered on major urban conurbations i think that's just the point oh, i make yeah no sure the um so in terms of burden yeah. I mean, clearly there's two. There's the size of the population, um, and there is the um, the morbidity load, load within it. But on what, what do you have any thoughts about um, first of all on mortality, on longevity, and you know the the the, the recent and current uh, plateauing of increases in life expectancy, a blip, or <coughs> do you see it as a as, as, as a perm, uh, you know, having reached a new plateau? Yeah, I think it's quite a contentious topic. Um, as I understand it, in terms of longevity, life expectancy, you know, the, most of the projections that I've seen, you know, suggest that, you know, life expectancy has gone up, over, you know, for, since the 1990s from 75 to about 81 now at birth. And, and if, there are various projections that say by 2030 it'll go up even further in men to about 85 and 80, about 87 in women by 2030. And that, that particular projection, which comes from the Lancet, suggests that the, the narrowing between life expectancy at birth for men and women is going to narrow. But it also suggests that if you look across the population, the inequality increases, so the variance in life expectancy increases. I'm, I'm not convinced <coughs> by the people who, who say that uh, the, you know, the, the increase in life expectancy is going to tail off on a plateau. Because the, if you look backwards, it's been pretty linear, the increase in life expectancy over time, despite some fairly major, major seismic shifts in social and, and uh, medical challenges. Um, I think the, 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 the sort of bigger questions is what happens to, to morbidity associated with that. And as I understand it, there are three sort of major hypotheses. One is that life expectancy keeps going up and we don't, because we can't um, treat or cure many of these conditions, we end up with an expansion of morbidity, sort of rather miserable scenario. There's, there's a sort of compression of morbidity scenario which says that improvements in general health, um, public health particularly, less smoking, more physical activity, will defer the age at which people get morbid conditions. But because life expectancy has a, has a a finite capacity that you actually get a compression of morbidity, the complete opposite. And that, to my mind, is a bit, is predicated on the assumption that there's a limit to human life, which is a fairly contentious topic. 
It returns the morbidity. Which but there is a, th can I, just, yeah, there sorry, is a yes. third one, which I think is the most likely scenario, which is where um, what happens is that you, you do defer morbidity a bit, but people live for longer with morbid conditions in older age. It's, it's sort of a balanced um, sort of uh, response. I think that's the most likely question. Sorry, I interrupt. No, I was going to say, so in terms of morbidity in areas obviously very close to, to, to your own ex you know, particular expertise and work, yeah. you know, thinking particularly about obesity and yeah. the associated uh, conditions that follow. Um, and that's seems to me is, is, has still not had the, the, the cohort of obesity is still coming through and hasn't really had a profound effect yet on things like longevity and life expectancy um, how do you see I mean to, to my mind that, well, that would suggest that in fact your rather optimistic view of this healthier ageing population the opposite is going to happen and people are going to die at a younger age than their parents did. I mean, there are people who... But it's a speculation. But it's perfectly possible that, that what will happen is that they will have... Uh, they will... You know, obesity is associated, as we know, with, with many things, but also with the treatment of many things. And that treatment is... It tolerates if the, those conditions. So it is perfectly plausible that... Uh, what will happen is more that we'll get a vast expansion of, of healthcare need and, and, and therapy and treatment in older age associated with obesity earlier in life without a major impact on, on, on mortality. Uh, it is, I think sometimes the, um, the obesity world you know, l likes to project this idea of future generations are gonna live less long than their parents you know, it is a scaremongering suggestion. It is speculation. We don't, it's unknowable. Um, but I think it's much more likely, whether it, that happens or not, we can see, but it's much more likely that the big thing will be a, a, a big increase in healthcare demand. Important. And um, so in, to summarize, what, 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 are the, what would you say is the major uh, consequences of obesity in terms of healthcare needs. Obviously, diabetes is one. Di diabetes is paramount. Yeah, right. yeah. because of the, largely because of the strength of the association. And um, you know, I think that well, we come back to to the response to it. But you know, there are, the estimates are you know that something like three plus million people have the condition now and you know it'll be nearer to five by 2030. Um, and maybe we'll come back to whether that's a good or a bad thing entirely. It's at one level it's obviously a bad thing but we'll come back to that. Um, I mean clearly the, there are the uh, the cancers associated with with obesity and as the Prevalence of smoking declines. One would anticipate that the population attributable risk of obesity-related cancers will go up, and particularly, you know, for uh, postmenopausal breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and endometrial cancer. And to my understanding, those three contribute about two-thirds of the the risk associated with the higher than desirable body mass index. So one would anticipate that those cancers would go up. Obesity is actually not a very strong risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It's actually a relatively weak uh, uh, risk factor. Um, but then there are the problems, uh, the musculoskeletal problems related to, um, to, to uh, obesity. Um, and uh, I think the, you know, when I was in a diabetes clinic, strangely, I mean, it links to the multi-morbidity problem. What is most challenging for very obese patients, I mean, the metabolic things one can largely deal with, but the, 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 the limitation in functional capability, the inability to do physical activity, you know, creating a vicious cycle, um, which is very difficult to break, uh, 
and uh, getting I think that's an important thing to be able to um, to encourage people to to be as physically active as they can be earlier in life in order to avoid the vicious cycle such <coughs> that if they become obese and then their knees are shot etc then they can't break out of that problem and that so that's a very challenging proposition one other thing I colleagues uh, have a chance to ask you things, um, and that is, um, in fact, you said uh, a few minutes ago um, this idea that that as the next generations coming through, as they get older, yeah. ourselves included, um, will have higher expectations and demands for health care. That's a. It, that's an opinion rather than evidence-based. But I think what, what I'm basing that on is that I've looked at the, some of the secular trends in the frailty and physical activity, and they do suggest that, th th that what I'm saying is correct, that people have more diseases if you look at secular waves, but actually they are functioning better and they're being more physically active. I think it's not illogical to to suggest that they they will um, wish to maintain that uh, functional capability as, as they get older and won't tolerate oh it's a you know you're, you're limited by being old and therefore you've got to uh, accept it. But that's that's an opinion rather than a fact. Yeah, I mean, an absolutely crucial factor seems to me, in forecasting future needs of surgery. Uh, given that we're all agreed that more and more surgery will focus on the 75 plus, and therefore it's vital to know what people over 75 will expect and not make yeah, exactly. assumptions that are overestimating. Perhaps, perhaps no, I, mean, but I don't know if it's a knowable phenomenon. Mm. I mean, we could, yeah. we could always ask them. Okay. I'll let my, uh, <laughs> Thank you. I'll Anna, go. could I just follow up with a question about uh, the over 75 group? What, what would you predict their cognitive health to be? Because clearly that will impact on their ability to, to make choices about um, complex surgical interventions. Sure. So, my, my understanding of the secular. You know, I thought I was going to have reinforcements today, by the way, so I hope that some, <laughs> some of these questions I could bat off to somebody who knew more about it, but you are, you are limiting, uh, you are uh, testing the limits of my knowledge, yeah. My understanding from the secular trend data is actually, although there are more people who are elderly and, more, and therefore there are more people with cognitive impairment, actually as a proportion, like the the, the, the improvement in functional capability. Actually, there are, more, th there are more people proportionately actually getting into old age who are, who are uh, d you know, their cognitive function is good, actually, which is a much slightly contrary message to the rather negative spin. That doesn't mean there isn't a demand for care and treatment for, the, for an increased you know, total number of people who have got cognitive impairment in old age, but as a proportion, actually things seem to be improving. So, so I think what you're saying is the, the total number of the ones who are able to make complex decisions will go up, yeah. and the total number of the ones who can't will also go yes, up. Yes, because surgery, you know, you change. don't, in terms of planning the future of surgery, you don't care about proportions or age-adjusted yeah. things, you care numbers. about absolute numbers of things. Yeah. Can I, can I um, ask you a, a, a different question, which relates to your expertise as a metabolic physician? Yeah. Um, and what, what do you anticipate as the uh, trend in demand for obesity curing surgery? Why does it go up? So you, you'd see that as a major part of the, the repertoire in the, the yes. future. I. Um like I said in my introduction, I, I'm un, in that unusual position where I see individual patients as well as, you know, advising <coughs> Public Health England on population approaches, and <coughs> we need we need to do a whole spectrum of things. So there's uh, a, the need for obesity surgery. I suspect will increase, and 
uh, and I think we should. There are clinical situations where it is required, and it's very uh, effective, and we should make it available to people. Should it be a panacea? Obviously not. Uh, but uh, I think it's it should be uh, uh, made more easily available. Actually. And, and do you have any sense of the kind of order of magnitude of increase we might see? I think that's an affordability question, mm. is how much, you know, how much are we prepared to pay for that as opposed to other things. And it's, it's a similar question for, for certain individual level preventive interventions. There isn't you know, an answer, we should do this for everybody. It's how much are we willing to pay for this as a society as opposed to something else? And, and the final question for me is about, uh, it's about the, the time lag of some of the interventions. So if we were to achieve a, a major success in public health prevention of obesity, what, what's the time lag to impact on the disease burden? Well, long. So um, one of the um, challenges, say, at the minute is Simon Stevens has pushed investment in the National Diabetes Prevention Programme, which is individual level preventive interventions in people at high risk, and it's predominantly waste, weight, provision of weight loss services to those people. And that is obviously a good thing, but the expectation that that will reduce the problem of diabetes is, is somewhat naive, because um, in the short term, if you uh, go looking for people who are at risk, you will unearth a lot of people with prevalent but undiagnosed uh, disease. So my estimation uh, was if you did rolled out the program and did roughly half a million HbA1c tests a year in the country, you'd instantly uh, find 35,000 people with prevalent but undiagnosed diabetes. So the prevalence has gone up. Now that might be a good thing because you're finding that disease early, but in terms of workload, <laughs> it's gone up. And then, depends how you estimate it, but you know, probably over a course of 10 years for the people enrolled in our healthcare program, you might prevent a thousand cases in 10 years' time. But you would also get a lot of people who drop out of this high-risk prevention uh, intervention and, and want to go back to their GPs for monitoring. So I, um, when we work on the National Diabetes Prevention Program, we have to see it as a long-term thing. That, that's individual level promotion. Because in the short term, it's going to increase demand because we're creating patients who weren't there before. Um, so I think that is quite a challenge if your premise for doing it is a reduction in costs. If, that, if you say, the reason we want to do this is <coughs> diabetes costs the NHS 10% of its budget and we have to do something about it, well, that, this, this sort of approach isn't going to do that because that actually could increase that. Whether it's good for health, we will see in time. It will take a long time to see that. And it clearly has the potential to, to assist. Um, but um, it comes back to the point, are we trying to aim for reduction in the number of people with diabetes, for example, or are we accepting that's quite challenging because if we find disease early and we treat it well, people will live with the condition for longer, so of course the prevalence will go up. Um, so actually reducing prevalence per se shouldn't be the goal. It should be reducing the incidence at age-specific uh, notion of, of the disease, if we can, but primarily reducing the complications, the health complications of the condition. That's a very long-winded answer, but it's a complex I issue. Let's pick up the specific surgical implications of that, because I, I understand what you're saying, that you know, finding more cases is going to increase health system costs, yeah. and that might have an impact because those costs are um, competing um, for resource for other, other types of healthcare services, including surgery. But... Um, the surgical conditions that, that stem from diabetes are still going to be 
clinically overt in the, the same way they are now. They, we're, we're not going to find more surgical disease because we find diabetes. Certainly un, un, unearthing diabetes per se won't, I don't think will increase uh, surgical need, but it, it will impact on primary care because those patients will require monitoring, etc. And I think the more you medicalize risk factors, the more you unearth things, you will create, you will increase healthcare demand across the board because you'll find other things too. The more incidental sure. findings potentially. Okay. Thank you. I guess I, I keep coming back in my mind to your first comment, which is we are going to be um, managing a population, a more elderly population with more obesity and diabetes, but with also higher expectations of, of the health care that can be delivered to them. And I suppose the real challenge is then how we manage, A, manage those expectations. So again, um, from if you want to bring cost into it, which perhaps is not the primary concern, but it must be a consideration. Should we be delivering surgery to our very elderly population um, with their multiple mor morbidities? And if we do, then actually we have to manage the significant complications that follow on from that. Because the reality is, if you subject a 76-year-old with diabetes and with preoperatively good cognitive function, then you can render them much worse off postoperatively. And I think, to me, that's the real challenge around that decision-making and how we manage them afterwards. No, absolutely. But is it? Um, I was talking with the uh, head of... Uh, anaesthetics about this very issue I mean it, it clearly is a major challenge the 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 the, uh, the post-operative cognitive problems but is it an inevitability or can medical uh, advances uh, ameliorate that problem I mean you know the the issue of the diabetes um, obviously there are some surgical conditions in in later life that if you like uh, maybe etiologically related to the to the diabetes or in some instances unrelated, but there, there must be some conditions which, where even though somebody has poorly controlled diabetes, actually undertaking their operation might increase their functional capabilities to such an extent that say physical activity could improve and then their diabetes would improve. So I think you might want to move away from the sort of rather um, formulaic thing that we see sometimes is, you know, I can't operate on this patient because their HbA1c is X. Well, what if by operating you really increase the probability that it will come down? I mean, it's a assuming bit of a... They assuming they survive. The but, you know, that's, that particular area of medicine is something I don't know anything about, so I'm sure it's in your capable hands. <laughs> Um, come back with the, um, the touch up. Some overall feel of the scope for prevention. We, we know what we've got now. We know the levels of obesity in childhood yeah. and so on. Um, <coughs> well, I spoke about individual approaches to prevention yeah. in slightly negative terms, partly because I don't think that's where the answer lies. Yeah. Um, so the centre that I lead is... Uh, developing the evidence base for more population approaches to prevention because it's the you know the, the the generation of epidemiologists before me many of them promoted the Jeffrey Rose's view of the world which is that for many of these risk factors you do achieve more by small shifts in population risk factors across a whole uh, uh, range of people rather you rather more benefit to that than focusing on high risk individuals and, and treating them and that uh, if you like ideology is 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 very worthy but it doesn't tell you what to do so the challenge of our center and others like it is to say okay that what is the evidence base for actually doing that achieving that and realizing that potential and that means really going upstream and essentially stopping the medicalization of problems related to physical activity and poor diet and accepting 
that we are individuals living in a societal context that's driving our behavior in a particular way. And it means moving away a bit from focusing on the individual and their knowledge, attitudes, uh, beliefs, and cognition, much more to trying to understand the way we structure society. Uh, and uh, in some sense, it's a very radical <laughs> view of what we need to do. Um, and, uh, but I think it is getting traction, and the evidence base can be developed. The problem is the evidence base is fundamentally different to, a, to like a medical evidence base because you can't have a linear approach of the accumulation of evidence, randomized controlled trials, systematic reviews, and then action at the end based on NICE's opinion of what we should do. Actually, the, 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 what you have to do is, is accumulate enough evidence that something could work, and then encourage action, and then evaluate it. And it, that's, there are some positive signs that things are happening. I don't know whether the sugar levy will or will not have a major impact, but it is a positive thing, and w uh, action has been taken, and we are actually uh, commissioned to do an evaluation of it. Um, so I think that as uh, physicians, I think we need to be suggesting that there is a limit to what medicine could and should do, and that actually that some people's statements that public health has failed, I think, are wrong in relation to things like obesity, physical activity, and, and diet. I think we haven't really tried in a bold and uh, uh, dynamic way, and nor have we put in place sufficiently rigorous evaluations to enable us to learn when and how things work. So, so what I'm hearing is there is a the potential. How optimistic are you as an individual that in 2030 and 2040 we will have um, less childhood young people obesity than we have now, or it will have stabilized, or it will be worse? Well, if you look back, you know, how confident would I have been 30 years ago that you walk around London and you see far fewer people smoking, you can travel on the tube, you know, people, would I have predicted that? No, probably not. So I, I am confident that I, I, would, um, I would not be confident that we can deal with this as a, a medical problem. I think that actually is a recipe for spending a lot of money and uh, ultimately being unsuccessful. I am confident that if we accept that and put in place structural things that mean that we live in, in environments that are conducive to physical activity that, uh, and that we alter the dietary supply and we address challenges like the price of healthy eating, that actually things can improve. Thank but then you. I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I come back and just talk about um, some of the figures that you, you suggested earlier on? And just, I want to be sure that I, I think you were referring to the number of cases of diabetes when we talked earlier on. So you suggested yeah. that there's, there's something around three and a half million people with diabetes yeah. now, by 2030, that figure is going to rise to about five million yeah, people. Four, four point six. I can, yeah, 4.6. I can, so if you like, I can send you this <coughs> citation that backs that up. Yeah. So it's, it's eight, nine percent of the population is going to yes. have diabetes at yes. that time. Nine point five. Can you just give 16. me a figure for the number of people who would be considered to be obese now? Yeah, sure. And what's the predicted figure for 2030? <laughs> I can tell you what it was and what it is now. What it's going to be, uh, you know. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, that's higher powers than I know that. Um, no, but you're 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 very knowledgeable in the in the area, so well, we respect your opinion. The big transition in obesity was in the 90s. So in '93, of the adult population, something like 15% were obese, and 53% were overweight. 
And by 2016, the obese number has gone up from 15 to 26 percent. That's a big shift. Actually, the overweight has gone up from 53 to 61. So you're talking about a shift in distributions, but most of that transition happened in the 90s and the early 2000s. And actually, the last few years, it's sort of plateaued. I mean, it's still going up a little bit, but it's not shooting up at the rate it was going up. And the honest truth is I don't know that anybody can really tell you what it's going to be in 2030. I'd be very surprised if it, if it shot up again at the rate it did in the 1990s. It, it was probably more likely to just plateau. I don't doubt if it's going to go back to 1990 levels. And we just may be able to, uh, with all the actions and all the small things that are done accumulated, stop any further uh, um, acceleration of, of, of obesity. Uh, but maybe the level of average body mass index in the population might settle to, if you like, a new norm. And, and what's the age profile of the patients who are considered to be obese? I mean, we've heard a lot about children's obesity, but there must be another uh, sort of, I hate to use, use the word bulge, of... Uh, yeah, sure. Of, it's an of, interesting of, phenomenon of obesity. So it depends, of course, how you measure it. So in children, it's measured differently. It's you know, not the body mass index, but, you know, that, that has seen a rise. And, you know, now 20% of children classified obese at the age of 10 or 11. Um, what happens if you look at weight gain? Weight, weight gain, as an absolute phenomenon, is um, is very inversely related to age. So the rate of weight gain is greatest in in young adults, and is probably driven by uh, you know changes in their physical activity, changes in you know their their social setting, you know, getting married, you know. People, absolute rate of weight gain is greatest at that age, and it declines very steeply with age, such that by the time you get 60 plus, you're actually losing weight. Um, but of course, um, come to the, the older group in a second. The, uh, but in terms of body mass index, it does keep going up across life, because it's the, you're adding weight to what you had before. But um, you know, as a medical, and a, and a surgical problem, it's presumably current BMI that matters. But in terms of prevention, probably it's the points at which weight, the, the rapidity of weight gain where we should be targeting the issue. And actually, I think that's much younger adults than we tend to normally think about. If we think about prevention, we've probably got to, uh, you know, obviously there are issues related to children, but I think there's a bit of a neglected uh, prevention area in, in adults you know, bet between the ages of 20 to 35. So that, that's, then, then as, we, as we all get older, in terms of um, weight, we tend to switch to this point of, of losing what weight in absolute sense. And that's linked mostly to this notion of obese, uh, sarcopenic obesity that you see in older people. That it's a combination of slowly increasing uh, fat percentage but when you get beyond 60, on average, you tend to start losing body mass, uh, lean body mass, rather, and muscle bulk. And I think that sarcopenic obesity in older age is a real challenge. And I, th I think it makes us, uh, I think it will be a problem for, for surgery, and I think initiatives where people are starting to think about, you know, can you do, should you be having Preoperative conditioning to try and increase muscle mass, increase you know fitness pre-elective surgery. That seems to me an eminently sensible idea and one that is likely to increase in need and traction over time as more elderly people. So are. exercise potentially is going to reduce the rate of sarcopenic muscle loss, I oh, presume. Yes, I mean it depends. Conditioning exercise, so yes, muscle strength. Uh, uh, and I think we probably have to uh, um, 
you know, think about uh, much more structured programs for trying to increase strength um, and muscle bulk as people age to, um, to avoid the problems related to the sarcopenia. So weights, not the treadmill then? Weight. Hmm? Weights, not the treadmill. I think a combination. <laughs> and maybe sometimes. So can I just, just follow this through? So if the if the biggest expansion or biggest increase in <coughs> the, the number of people becoming obese at the younger age group was in the nineties. Yeah. <coughs> so they're they're going to be demanding of the health service um, in the next ten to twenty years if the impact of their weight gain in terms of uh, degenerative disease, metabolic disease, um, obesity-related cancers, is actually something we're going to see more in the next 20 years than we have done in the previous 20 years, because they're not quite at an age where they will be presenting with those diseases. Is that right? So the burden of disease because of obesity there could be even though the numbers aren't, aren't rising, actually sure. the, the the demand on the service is going to rise very so, significantly. Yeah, because of uh, the rapidity of a wave in a, a generation who lived through the 90s, yes, I think that probably is true. Do you have the figures? The, it's very interesting, the, the weight loss in the elderly. Uh, in an absolute sense. Yes. So do, do you have figures on, say, from the 1990s on, was the proportion, say, of the over 75s who are obese? And has that, what is that sort of proportion? You gave it to us for, you know, yeah. children and they... I think I might have it. I here. mean, are we actually talking about, you know, obesity, that you know, people become obese as children, a certain proportion, tend to go on being obese as adults and more join them, and then after from 60 onwards, gradually there's weight loss. Because for surgery, if we're thinking that there's going to be, as there already is, but even more surgical burden is going to come in the elderly, yeah. but actually obesity may not be right. such an issue in that age group. It's a bit heretical, but I think that is true, actually. But I think we should more worry more about the sarcopenia mm -hmm. than the obesity, per se, in the elderly. Yes. Because there are... You know, there are other conditions where being slightly obese when you're older, you know, relate, it, it reduces the risk of yeah. certain uh, problems like hip fracture given a fall. Yeah. You have a cushion. So um, I was trying to find the numbers. The, the absolute um, prevalence of obesity does tail off as you get over 75. Um, just trying to give you the exact number. I assume there's a bit of a healthy survival effect in there, there's, a combination of the two. But there's that plus... But actually people's appetites drop, their intake drops. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's more a function that there's this... That BMI is a large, you know, it's driven by weight, yeah. obviously high squared, and it's driven by weight rather than fat percentage. Yes. So yeah. if you looked at fat percentage, you'd see something slightly different. Okay. But that's an interesting notion, isn't it, that the, the, the concern about surgery in the plus 75-year-old age group is not so much about their BMI, but it's more about the, the general condition that they're in, in the face of exactly. muscle loss as you're getting older, yes. and their ability to get through surgery. And the accumulated impact of having been obese mm -hmm. in terms of cancers, musculoskeletal. Yeah, um, but it's not the obesity. Diabetes. Per se. And the yeah, diabetes the, secreted. Yeah, no, yeah. I think um, that's true. Which, which they'll unfortunately carry on into their old age, even if their BMI has gone down. Or, sure. It, yes. Okay, that's, that's, that's very helpful. Um, we've got just four minutes left. And there's, there's just a couple of things I would ask of you. Sure. Firstly, um, if you look at the Global Burden of Disease Projects, yeah. and it talks about the uh, years of life lost, yeah. the, the four conditions that are highlighted are ischemic heart disease, uh, cardio, cerebrovascular disease, dementia, and obstructive airway disease. Yeah. Now, presumably that profile is going to change considerably over the next 20 years, is it not, given that our ischemic heart disease is certainly still reducing. Um, 
the dementia, unfortunately, is likely to rise or become a greater player in amongst that. But with less smoking, uh, dare I say it, the Clean Air Act and so on, is obstructive airways disease going to going to be a, a, a lower player? How do you how do you see that panning out? Because I mean, you know, years of life loss is only one of the metrics yeah. that that you know the global burdens disease project focuses on and um, uh, m my uh, reading of those projects which are rather difficult to sometimes to um, actually follow is that actually even though there have been changes uh, and improvements in cardiovascular uh, mortality as, as you indicated that actually the ranking of, of the top conditions in the past 20 years hasn't actually changed very dramatically. I, I, don't, I, I think what you're putting forward uh, is probably right. I, I ascribe to the sort of Chris Witte view that you know, coronary disease, CHD mortality is, uh, since the 70s has gone down by 73%. And there's, I don't think there's any reason to think that it won't keep going down. And, it, and his you know, uh, thesis is that it's not any one individual things, it's just a multitude of small things that we do in public health and medicine that's caused that. And I don't see any reason that that uh, will, 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 will change. So I think that will go down. Um, I think you, whether, um, you know, uh, whether the respiratory conditions uh, associated mortality alters. I think obviously smoking, we can, we can uh, predict what will happen quite what will happen in, 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 to, to air pollution. It lies in the hands of politicians. And it, it may have a true impact. Although air pollution has both a, a chronic and an acute yeah. effect on yeah. mortality. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think uh, I'm trying to avoid the question. Okay. Last question, and it's and it's kind of almost a one-word answer. We we've talked about prevention and, and preventative medicine. Do you really think that preventative measures are going to have an impact on the overall burden of disease in the next 10, 20 years? Yeah. You do. Yeah, I do. Um, and the biggest impact being where. But the biggest impact will come if we take seriously this proposition of public health, uh, societal level interventions. This, that doesn't mean that I'm arguing against the sort of preventive medicine initiative. We just did a, an evaluation of the health checks program, pub publishing plus medicine, and our estimation is that program is, on average, increasing uh, life expectancy by about at the household level per person by about three to five days. Now that sounds peanuts, but that's probably comparable to other screening programs, mm. and it's associated roughly with 300 premature deaths per annum avoided. But that's a lot of effort and medicalizing uh, a problem for a small benefit, and I think the big gains will come from from these more societal efforts to, to, to in for health promotion and uh, public health. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Sorry, my very pleasure. interesting. Thank you. Um, the aim of this is for us to, uh, to have a, a chance to discuss with you uh, the future of surgery and the future of surgical care. Um, and this is a project that um, has come obviously from the college uh, with a view to trying to look at where surgery is going to go over three different time points, over the next five years, over the next ten years, and then to try to, to gaze forward into what things are going to look like in, in 20 years' time. Uh, why are we doing this? Well, uh, because we think it's important. Uh, we think it's important at a national level um, so that we can try to, to get 
the evidence from experts about where we're going and how we need to, to plan surgical services for the future. We think it's important at a college level so that we can try to make sure that what we do in terms of trying to uh, look at the standards for delivery of surgery and how we train surgeons is appropriate for the, the type of surgery that we're going to be delivering over that time period. So these sessions uh, are a very important part of the commission. Uh, they are being recorded uh, both on video and sound and it is intended that they will be streamed on YouTube as well. Uh, I'm not sure about the, the live streaming this morning as to whether that's working very well, but uh, if it is, there will also be question, uh, opportunities for people who are watching the streaming to ask questions of, uh, of these sessions. Um, obviously, if there are uh, issues that are potentially sensitive, either from a commercial point of view or a scientific point of view, uh, we would not wish for you to put those in the public domain, but if you feel that they are relevant, then we would ask perhaps you can let us know by email at a later stage. Um, after the session, uh, we would also just ask if you may be able to hang around for a few minutes just to do some very brief interviews, which we will use again to, to stream on the college website, just for thoughts about the whole thing. Um, in terms of how the session will run, uh, I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves as to uh, your position and roles, uh, but then also just give us uh, a few moments on where you think surgery is going to go, and perhaps what are the important things that we need to be thinking of, um, and we'll perhaps get you to do that in turn, um, and then we have a series of of questions, but what I hope will evolve will and open up into a more sort of open discussion. And I'd be very grateful if all of you can get engaged in those discussions because it's it's rare for us to get expertise like this in one room at the same time. So um, perhaps we could start off um, with you, Professor Wilcox, ladies first. Uh, so, I'm Ruth Wilcox, I'm from the University of Leeds, I'm Professor of Biomedical Engineering there and also the Director of the Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering, which is a multidisciplinary research institute there. Um, my primary focus is really on medical devices uh, for orthopaedic applications, uh, musculoskeletal applications, um, the development and the preclinical testing of those. Um, but today I have another hat on as well because I'm representing the panel of biomedical engineering of the Royal Academy of Engineering, um, who have already presented a written response. Um, 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 and subsequent to that, we actually met as a panel on Tuesday and had some further discussions. So I shall try and relay some That's of awesome. those parts back to you as well. Thank you. Ruth's introduction makes it difficult for me to say anything significantly different. I'm Constantine Fuchsis. I'm a professor of biomedical <laughs> engineering at the University of Oxford. I'm the director of the Oxford Institute of Biomedical Engineering. Um, I have also um, started um, three companies, two of which have a surgical focus. One is Organox Limited, which has developed devices for organ transplantation, and one is Orthoson, where um, in a project that has had some involvement from Ruth, we have developed a new technique for non-invasive disc replacement in the orthopedic sector. Last but not least, hi, I, I'm, I'm Tony Palika. I'm Professor of uh, Stem Cell Transplantation and Transplant Director at King's uh, as a bone marrow transplanter, of course. Um, we, uh, in my other role, uh, is as a newly appointed, well, past couple of years, as the National Clinical Lead for Regenerative Medicine for NHS England uh, in an attempt to try and understand the evolving field of cell and gene therapy and how it's going to impact on clinical delivery and we were having a conversation earlier but we'll, we'll, we'll open up on that uh, as we develop right. the, the session. So Ruth, can I come back to you then and just give us a, 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 your thoughts on um, the future of surgery uh, as regards the uh, bio mechanical engineering. Sure. Field. So I suppose kind of representing the broad range of activities that are uh, being undertaken across the engineering sector is clearly <coughs> A number of those which we think will play into the future of surgery. And in, in the written response of the mm. Academy, we outlined some of those areas. It certainly wasn't meant to be an exhaustive list, but that included systems biology, nanomedicine, biomaterials, tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, robotic systems, biomechanics, computational modeling. Um, 
uh, subsequent to that, we also have the discussion uh, at our panel meeting about sensing and imaging. Um, I believe that David Hawkes from UCL is coming to a, to a, a meeting in the, in the future in this, as part of this series, so I can perhaps elaborate a little bit more on that, that particular area. Um, but I suppose across all of those, um, the, the, I think we recognise that there's actually a, a kind of a convergence of technologies as well, so they're not just pockets of individual technologies that are being developed, but, but they're coming together of those, which is perhaps more likely to transform surgery uh, and, and different surgical approaches. So we definitely see a rise in minimally invasive surgery, uh, earlier stage interventions, um, and potentially then more uh, specialist units being involved in some of the... Um, the more complex surgery that involves uh, uh, stem cells, for example, or that it involves computational modelling in parallel with surgery to define an outcome. So, kind of, I suppose that in some cases, definitely a, a, a convergence of technologies that will require very specialist centres, but perhaps alongside that, also earlier stage interventions that maybe are not even undertaken in a hospital, but in the, uh, uh, but, but in the community. So. Quite a big spread, quite a big spread yeah, there to, yeah. to, to go on, um, and I think across all of those, we also recognise the importance of engineering, collaborating further with with surgeons, um, and some of the opportunities that perhaps we can come back to to in, in further discussions about uh, why that's important and where it can fit in. Okay, and, and if I could just get you to stargaze, we'll we'll do the the end at the beginning here. So, what do you think is the biggest impact? that this field's going to have in those three time points, 5, 10, 20 years? Um, I think in, in the short term, um, perhaps more incremental change in current surgery, so for example, bringing in more robotics into surgery, um, better sensing diagnostics and imaging into, into current surgery, um, and then progressing that further. And I think at this point, I can only really speak from my own experience in the, in the kind of musculoskeletal field. I think that the, the earlier stage interventions that potentially delay the need, for example, for total joint replacement will uh, come more to the fore. I don't think that's going to prevent the need for joint replacements, quite frankly, but I think it will, it will delay it. That might have additional complications because the patients may be older with more comorbidities when they get to that point. Um, um, uh, yeah, so, so I suppose in, in, in MSK, I don't see um, the... the the kind of the traditional surgery totally dying out, if, if you like, in the next 20 years. Um, perhaps the others can speak from, from other fields in a bit more detail. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Constantine. Yes, yeah, so, so my thoughts are that surgery is really changing um, in three directions. Uh, so moving primarily towards greater emphasis on non-invasiveness and so minimal invasiveness. Secondly, um, moving towards greater precision um, and that will involve um, things like molecularly targeted um, strategies and new optical methods that replace or supplement the surgeon's vision. And for me, the third very important axis is patient specificity that we are hearing from in every field and every direction now, be it oncology, be it surgery, that the one-size-fits-all approach is, is rapidly dying. And I think within that patient specificity, there are really three areas which I think are well represented here. So there is um, you know, cell-based therapies, which clearly require a, a very patient-specific understanding. Um, there is drugs, and this is particularly exemplified by immuno-oncology at the moment, where you, know, you really need to know a lot about not only the patient, but the sub-tissue type you're treating to decide what course of treatment you might choose, very often as a precursor or sometimes simultaneously or right after surgery. Um, and, and, and last but not least, I think the other aspect of patient specificity, which has already been alluded to by Ruth, is, is, is you know, understanding differences in anatomy, mm -hmm. in BMI. So, so image-based patient-specific approaches are increasingly being incorporated into practice. And I see all of these three things con uh, as converging towards surgery or, or whatever surgery may become in the future as achieving a greater quality of life and greater efficacy at the outcome of these interventions. Um, my view of the most fundamental change is that surgery will not be surgery in, in 20 years. I think we're seeing a blurring of the disciplines. So in all the things I've mentioned, I've mentioned drugs, I have mentioned imaging. You know, I think surgery will start moving a little bit closer to what in America is known as interventional 
radiology. Um, I think there will be not a surgeon in the land who will be able to operate without being able to read and navigate images in 3D. Um, and I think, I think it will also move much closer to other areas such as oncology, um, regenerative medicine, um, 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 and I think that has implications for surgical training, which we can discuss. Challenging. <laughs> Antonio. Uh, well, I would absolutely concur with that. I suppose uh, I'd, I'd look at it in a slightly different way, uh, in, in concurring exactly what Constantine has said, but to think about how we're going to uh, remove the uh, silo mentality that we currently have, even between the colleges um, and uh, between physicians and surgeons. Um, uh, I, I can joke because I'm old enough to do that uh, uh, about the difference between the physician and the surgeon, why I didn't become a surgeon uh, rather than uh, became a physician. Uh, but actually, I didn't feel I had the bottle to do the surgery, and so becoming a physician was a little bit easier. But uh, I wanted to be more involved in the whole patient pathway of care. The, the surgeons are fantastic at that high-end stuff and doing that critical stuff in surgery, but they need to understand now we've got end-to-end -end solutions for the care of a patient. So when we think about uh, uh, surgery uh, in the 1970s, Bill Roth II was a standard procedure, and then Sir James Black invented cymetidine, and now uh, if you ask a surgeon, can you do a Bill Roth procedure, they might look at you askance and say, I'll look it up and, and I'll think about doing it. So we need to understand that the changes, medical impacts are going to have a significant change on the practice. We also need to understand that the personalized diagnostics that we are absolutely exploding with at this moment in time through the Genomic Center and, and Sue Hill are going to mean that we are hopefully going to define disease at a much, much earlier stage. We have a strong lead in on that in hematological malignancies because we've been, it's easy to access, we've been doing the genetics for years and years. And a lot of those genomic <coughs> abnormalities can be detected at a very, very early stage. And I think that's actually going to be true whether it's in breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer. So the surgeon is actually, may not even be involved in that process management because there isn't a lump as such to remove for the surgical diagnostics. Uh, the uh, late presentations will always occur. You will still need the surgeon, but on the whole, if we screen, then we will detect lesions that are tiny. And if they're tiny lesions, it will be an interventional radiologist that will do the biopsy unless the surgeons take on that process. Uh, similar to what's happened in vascular medicine with, with uh, interventional radiologists now taking some of the mantle from vascular surgeons or neurosurgeons losing out to uh, uh, you know, vascular interventionists doing some of their work for them now with coiling or whatever. So earlier diagnosis, earlier treatment, so measurable disease or measurable residual disease can be managed with a drug or a cellular therapy. Uh, we're involved in CAR-T programs at King's. Uh, we're using both autologous and allogeneic CAR-Ts. These are uh, seismic changes in the management of cancer. Uh, and what I'm finding is we're being approached by surgeons, can we do this and can we do that, without them necessarily understanding the logistical regulatory hurdles around it. So, I would use a term, the institutional readiness of the N NHS or in, indeed individual departments to manage some of the structures that are required to deliver this are not there. Uh, and they're not there in, in, in all aspects, not just surgery, in medicine as well as surgery. And we need to create that training program. And, and the barrier difference, I mean, the Lancet Commission on Stem Cells and Regenerative Medicine was just published this week. Uh, saying that how do we get systems biologists, how do we get engineers, and how do we get a surgeon to be the same thing, i.e. that the training programs, the barriers that I would have faced, you know, my training at Cambridge, I had, I trained with the natural scientists, and then we went our separate ways. But actually, we shouldn't be going our separate ways. We should be doing the same thing. So the, 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 the physician and the scientist need to be closer. And we need training programs that allow that to happen, and training programs that incentivize that. So 
for the greater good of this country because the, whether Brexit has created some issues for us, uh, we do need to think about the industrial strategy. We need to think about how we make it easier for the great science to come through and be delivered in clinical practice. And we need hospitals or centres of excellence that will develop those skill sets. Not every hospital is going to do this. We won't be able to afford it but we can develop that so that in, in 20 years time I don't see uh, surgical departments looking like they do at this moment in time. We will have robotic skill sets, uh, robotic systems in place. Uh, one only has to look at Japan uh, to see the, the, the advancement there in, in robotic processes. Um, and, and I think we won't be able to afford to have all the staff that we think we need to have, we'll need to have those robotic AI systems in place. So, it, it, and, and from the point of view of training, we, we, it's not about training today's surgeons. We need to train people at GCSE and at A level to be have the knowledge base and skill set to then think about going to university to study this sort of uh, blurred image of what is medical training, so that that's taught and then training programs that blur the definition between medicine and surgery so that we can then create individuals that will be the individual future docs. Right, um, there's so much there <laughs> that's, that's fascinating. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off by um, coming in at the, the training now. And, and I accept that we need, perhaps we need to go back to earlier years training, but, but coming in and looking at the training now. So there is a, um, I think there's a mood of innovation at the moment in this country um, amongst the, the training grades. And I think that to a large extent that mood of innovation is being stifled by the very regimented training programs that we currently have. Um, so in terms of, of quick things that we could do, for example, we could say to people who are training, um, look, you don't need to go and write papers anymore and write a research, research thesis. What you could do is go and spend six months or a year uh, working in an area of innovation that interests you. And there are so many avenues that people can get into. But what that means is that that's got to become an acceptable part of training, which at the moment it doesn't seem to be. So a, a, the, the quick change would be to, to try to diversify what the juniors are currently doing uh, into areas that interest them um, and try to allow them to bring those areas of interest back into healthcare. Do you think that's, there is a possibility, an opportunity to do that? Uh, within the, the framework that we've currently got. Well, okay. Ruth first, and then okay. I, I will answer. <laughs> um, I think we, we had this discussion at the panel meeting, actually, um, and the, the, sort of the recognition around the table was that actually there seem to be fewer opportunities now for uh, clini clinicians during training to, to take time out to do higher degrees, for example. Um, and we certainly see fewer in t in coming into our labs. And that was seen as a real potentially quick a fix solution to, 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 to make that uh, a more acceptable part of the career pathway, I suppose. Um, that clearly has advantages for surgeons going through in terms of seeing the, te the emerging technologies firsthand in a lab and perhaps getting a bit more training on a kind of a broader brush of, uh, 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 of the kind of the underpinning engineering and, uh, and basic sciences. But it also has advantages, I think, for the engineers uh, and, and the basic scientists in getting more of the, the clinical pull earlier on in their careers if they're working alongside people in the laboratories and really understanding the, the differences between those. And uh, I, I think that, has, that can only have positives for innovation generally. So. I mean, the other, what we're talking here is, is, is adapting and modifying the surgeon by all these very exciting, promising new advances. So the other model would be to working alongside engineers and other, t other types of scientists, which wouldn't require such a radical change in surgical training. The pros and cons of those two 
make it, making the all singing, all dancing new person, probably shouldn't even call him a surgeon, this new creature that all got this picture of. I'd, I'd like to, to, to take a stab at, at some of the suggestions that were made, and, and I think looking at, at the past is very, very important also at informing the future, because some of these things have been tried. So, so first of all, I think we have to acknowledge that not everyone is an innovator. So I think this idea of taking every single surgeon and putting them for six to nine months in a lab, it's entirely possible that 75% of them would not actually benefit. I have seen that sort of thing work very well, but I have also seen that sort of thing yield absolutely nothing. And we must not assume that we necessarily have the lab capacity no, and to, I wasn't to, suggesting to, that to, all to provide a meaningful yeah. experience to every yeah. single training surgeon in that way. I think, I think where we were, and there, you know, there are others who have been around for far longer than I have, and they can comment on what, what was happening further in the past, but there was a, a period in, in sort of the 2000 to 2010 where almost excessive importance was being paid to postgraduate training and research in people's career path. And we had a lot of people actually going into a research, let's call it a spade a spade, as a, as, as a better way of achieving consultant status in a desirable location. And that actually didn't yield that much more innovation once they reached that position because it was a means to an end. Then there was an overcompensation by the system. And my understanding is in the last few years when people have been applying for a training number, having a PhD from a basic science lab counts for virtually nothing. It's sort of a, a very, very small percentage of the overall score. And, and, and I, think, I think we need to find a solution between those two extremes. Please, Lorna. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think you're right, absolutely, in terms of it was an expectation that people would undertake a postgraduate degree. I think with the change which is coming about in training across the board, and with the shape of training report, which is hopefully will be implemented in some capacity over the next year or so, and there is a change in the surgical curriculum, Will the, the, one of the buzzwords about the shape of training report is flexibility to allow individuals across the board the flexibility to leave the program to do something different and then to re-enter the program at a later stage or to follow a clinical academic track which might be traditionally basic science but I think we can really be more innovative in terms of, of who they collaborate with and I know that some of the bo uh, postgraduate um, if you like, programs do consider that. I guess Imperial is an obvious example which provides. So I think there is an opportunity here. Um, so I would be optimistic going forward. Uh, and the other opportunity, it seems to me, is that an increasing number of medical schools, and our own is one of them, is introducing a bit like Oxford and Cambridge, a compulsory honours year. And to my mind, that's a fantastic opportunity at a much earlier level. It's not quite GCSE, but it's a third year medical school to offer um, students that, that appetizer, really, of a one year, really, uh, in an area like this. And that would be some uh, two possibilities which I think we should be exploring. Because I think your point is well made. We can't really expect somebody to be everything. It, I, we can't expect them to deliver surgical services whilst also being a bioengineer, but to have an understanding of it and to work alongside experts, and this is where perhaps we come to one of the really primary philosophies about this, which is we've got to work better as a team in the broadest sense of the word um, moving forward. So that, that would be my comment, I'm really yeah, interested no, I'm, to hear. I'm, I'm not being pessimistic at all, but the question I would ask very sharply is, what is it? So the flexibility is there, and I, have, I currently have people coming through my lab who are taking advantage of this flexibility. The real question is, once they go back into full-time practice, what, what do they go back into? What, 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 what mechanisms are in place to make sure that those skills and the time that these people have invested in broadening their horizons and learning something can actually be turned into benefit for surgical practice? Because my impression at the moment is they, they then you know, rejoin a fairly conventional medical track, and within a year and a half, they have been so swamped by clinical duties that whatever benefit you had achieved is all but lost to the system. And, and the only other idea I want, I want to plant is I also think we ought to look at who we encourage to become a surgeon. So you could actually try and turn someone into more of an engineer 
towards the, the, the middle of the end of their medical training. You could also go about it the other way around. You could say we could actually encourage graduate medicine programs so that people who actually have started with a first degree in engineering, in math, in physics, actually have a relatively well-carved path to then take some of that. And, 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 and these programs are, exist, they exist in Oxford, they exist in Cambridge, but they're few and far between, and they take a remarkably small subset of the total number of surgeons we train. Why? It's a great career for people who are minded mechanically. I mean, surgery, you know, if I hadn't been an engineer, I would have been a surgeon. It's, it's all plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't say that. I think we're looking at two different things. We're looking at innovators and, and driving innovation and advance. But then actually, the, the bigger part of adopting that and getting that into practice and it's a different it's a different thing and requires probably different skills and getting the occasional very innovative very driven surgeon who's going to go out and look for collaboration and look for training is one thing but getting the vast rump of practicing new practicing surgeons conversant enough that they can adopt, they can see, they can adopt, they can push for adoption and use these things is, a, is a, a slightly different thing, but in many ways is the biggest hurdle that I see. And what do you think about that and getting these, the, not the cutting edge, exciting new stuff, but how you then get that yeah, into I, regular practice? I, I, I commonly say the, the great science and the great translation meet the immovable beast of the NHS, uh, which it indeed is. Uh, I think I'd go back and touch on a point. If you go around the large medical schools across the country and say, let's look at the professorial department of surgery, I would argue that over a generation we've seen a, a sort of less input there, partly driven by the REF, partly driven by grant income, to focus on a superstar disciplinarian and whatever discipline it is and not necessarily always surgery. So I think surgeries ended up in many institutions not having the prominence it actually deserves and requires to develop an image to the medical students uh, and to the junior docs who are thinking about what do I do? Do I become a GP, a surgeon, a physician, an obstetrician, or, or a clinician scientist? Now, you copy what you've seen before. I, I, I would suspect it's true for all of us in this room. If I said, name me the three or four people that defined your career, we'd be pretty quick to say who it was. We know that. They, they acted as that visionary who thought, I want to be like that. Are we seeing that in surgery in all institutions? The answer is no, because they're run off their feet, delivering you know, the acute end of surgery, the large volume. We touched on age, uh, the comorbidity issues. You, know, you can have people you know, having hip replacements at the age of 96. It's astonishing. Uh, so uh, we, we do need to recreate the, the role. Going back to does everybody need to do this, the answer is absolutely not. We need to create, the German vision is to have senses of excellence. Uh, I think we should learn from that. The American vision has absolutely always been the senses of excellence. Uh, we shouldn't be trying to create five star everywhere. The shape of training, in my view, is not creating five star. The aim of shape of training is to create three stroke, four star good individuals who will do a great job in medicine, surgery, and any other discipline. What we need to create are post-CCT pathways or intermediate pathways that allow them access to these opportunities, and they need to be appropriately funded. What tends to happen is, go away and apply for a grant, and you lose the will to live, and so you don't end up getting the grant, and you therefore don't take all the talent. Men, much of that talent goes to the US, or another country, where there is a, I can tell you from the cell and gene therapy point of view, two of my colleagues, one at MD Anderson, the other one at Sloan Kettering, uh, they have now created cell and gene therapy programs. They are already tweeting to me, do you have any good guys who'd like to come and do this one or two year program? 
So they're sucking the lifeblood out of us when we've got all the bits here. We've got the great science. We've got the great translation. We do need to fix the delivery bit, institutional readiness. Are we able to deliver and are we able to facilitate that good guy who's done a great PhD or MD thesis, wants to innovate in the center, and then meets the business manager who says, no, you can't do that. So if you step back a little bit earlier to the undergraduate level, um, do you think that the medical degree itself should change to accommodate the diversity of, of interest that, that uh, medical graduates are going to be exposed to. So should we be having modules in undergraduate training about robotics or genomics or molecular biology or uh, pharmacology or bioengineering? Should that be an integral part, accepting that not everyone's going to be a bioengineer, not everyone's going to be a robotics expert, but at least they understand the language? discussion at the panel as well about <laughs> should, should clinicians be engineers effectively and where the training should come in and I think the general consensus was no there's no need to kind of have the, the, necessarily although it's, it's one route in to have a kind of a first degree in some more technical uh, engineering or, or science based subject but having some kind of training that ensures that the majority of surgeons are, are tech savvy of some yeah. description I, I think seems to be kind of essential an essential part of how surgery will, will evolve um, and then there's you know there may be the more specialist routes at a higher level for particular individuals that have an interest in innovation and, and, and translation for example but but at the kind of the core undergraduate level it does seem that there's going to be a need to have some broader courses anyway and perhaps the kind of the Oxford Cambridge having the natural sciences in the, in the first year process helps, um, perhaps bringing in some more engineering into that as well. Um, but I think we're having the same discussions in, in the engineering field as well, because I, we have our kind of traditional subjects, but actually where all the innovation is taking place is not in pure mechanical or pure electrical engineering. So having a broader range, a broader base on which to then specialise seems, seems important. I think only people who have been through surgical training can generally, generally provide an answer to the following mm -hmm. question, which is what percentage of your first degree is actually really useful in being a surgeon today? Um, and, and if the answer to that is, you know, eight, 75 percent or more, then clearly that needs to remain the foundation. If the answer to that is, well, actually probably about 25 percent or less is still active knowledge that is needed day in, day out, then I would actually favor the more American model of allowing a, a, a range of degrees to more openly go into medicine and supplement, because you, you say, how do you do it for everybody? Well, one way to do it is to try and, and do it afterwards for everybody, but another way to do it is to introduce a diversity from day one, and the diversity of thinking from day one. And if there was a way to actually say, well, we will encourage universities to have a number of degrees that could lead to graduate medicine. And of course, people will also have to do anatomy, physiology, and these core subjects. But these can perhaps be done on top of another scientific discipline. It would be one way to achieve that. The other model, which has been very um, prominent in the physical sciences, and, and both Ruth and I have, have worked a lot with, is Centers for Doctoral Training. And so the idea with Centers for Doctoral Training is that people come at the end of their degree and they then have a year of general postgraduate training, which typically involves two lab rotations. And that can almost be thought of as a, as a mixed taught masters, taught masters by research year. And out of these two projects, th there is quite often a filtration point at the end of that year. And m the better students actually choose one of those two projects to turn it into a, a, a proper research project. And it may be that something like this could actually be introduced for surgery, whereby you have a period of either six or 12 months somewhere in the program where everybody has some taught innovation courses and then does a couple of research project rotations at their institution. And those who are picked out to be born innovators are then encouraged to move into that three-year track, so to take longer out of the program. But that is only going to work if at the end of that third year they can access something more exciting and more innovative than a very nice clinical job. So if, if a job can be created at the end of, you know, the research surgeon, 
So someone who potentially will, by default, have 50% of their time protected to do research. So these need to be attractive jobs in order to attract the best people and the best innovators to move that practice into the NHS. Andy Carr in Oxford, who I, I know you know well, very well. talks um, very eloquently about surgeon scientists um, who, who have a, a career path that's actually mapped out to allow them to spend time in science as well as time in surgery. Um, funding of the model, I mean, if we have additional modules, potentially the course is going to be a bit longer. Whether we can adapt the course to make it better, more efficient, uh, may be the solution, but there is potentially an issue about funding. Um, there's quite a lot of work which you're describing, which in the end is not going to come to anything. But you've still got to fund it. People have still got to eat as they're, as they're spending time in these various modules. Uh, is that something that should be central, centrally funded? Or is this something we had to partner with industry to, to support it? How do, we, how do we do that? Well, the way CDTs were introduced in the physical sciences were a mixture of both. So I, I think the, the first body to approach would be the MRC to start adopting this model. I'd be inclined to pilot the scheme in a small number of centres of excellence first with, you know, there are typically cohorts of 20 students a year. That's a sort of, so, you know, if you created three centres with 20 students, you'd get a first population of 60 people you could follow. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and those CDTs would then be very heavily supported by um, the surgical industry. And the idea is that we, you would give people not only technological training, but also training in designing clinical trials, in doing evidence-based medicine, in dealing with a regulatory landscape of innovation, which are things that these companies would highly value, because then the UK would become the first port of call. You know, that contact, that student they sponsored for their CDT would then become the next big corporate X trial five years down the line, because the contact exists. And it would not only bring innovation, but it would also bring investment to support that innovation within the NHS. I mean, it's, it's certainly very clear something's got to change if you consider that something like 30 to 40 percent of medical graduates are leaving medicine at around uh, core training level, so after their foundation years. Tem temporarily. Temporarily. Now, yeah, the number coming back yeah. is, is clearly important, and I don't have a figure for no, that, to be honest. It, but it, it, it's not as alarming as no, no, I, I absolutely it. accept that. But, um, but, I mean, the headline figure is still a large number are leaving at that age, at that, that early stage. Uh, I, what I hope is that they do come back a little bit later on. But if you also look at the number of people going into surgical training, so, uh, I mean, the, in neurosurgery, we, we used to have a situation where we would have upwards of 10 people applying for each post. And we're now down to perhaps two or three people applying for each post. And in some disciplines, actually, there aren't enough people applying for the post, so they're unable to fill them. So something has to change in surgery. I think we have to be clear that we're not talking about a surgeon scientist here, because that structure is in place. And there are a number of surgeons. I guess maybe what we're talking about is a surgeon innovator, almost, isn't it? It's a slightly different pathway, if you like. Because I think the surgeon scientist, the clinician scientist, is, is whether it's how successful it is in different parts of the country is highly variable. <coughs> but it is, it is there, you, usually with external funding uh, with, as fellowships. But I, I think we're talking about something a little bit different here and links with industry. And so it's innovation, really, isn't it? Well, I, I tried to provide you with both because I was trying to answer um, some yeah. questions. So the, 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 the the year I was suggesting, the sandwich year, the six to 12 months, mm. would actually achieve better training for everybody and two small lab rotations for everybody to expose all surgeons to these techniques. And I'm only suggesting that then there should be a springboard from that to extract the surgeon scientist or the surgeon innovator and give them a career path towards benefiting the NHS over the longer term. But not everyone will be in a position to do that, and I think yeah. we need to acknowledge that. I think, as Constantine said, we are. If someone said that you were going to uh, treat a hundred patients to benefit two, you'd say, "Nice would probably say that's probably not a valuable product here," uh, and. And, and in a way, that's what we're doing. And it happens in medicine as well as in surgery. 
that just because people want to have that ticket of the MD or the MSc or the PhD because they think it will get them a plum job in a teaching center, not necessarily, it's not about a better job, but they want the academic input of the teaching center. Uh, but then we, we do need to facilitate that. We need to make it easier to, for the, the right individuals to access that. We need to have national training programs. Remember, the whole purpose of HE and the shape of training is to accelerate the process of people coming out the other end. They don't want people to break their training. They want people to be trained and then do post-CCT fellowships. So it could be that we, but we need to get in early. We need to attract those individuals into the discipline and show them what a great discipline it is. In medical school, SSMs, special study module opportunities, and you will find lots of uh, interested parties. I think if you make it an interesting study module in uh, bioengineering or uh, cell and gene therapy, Martin Poulet, a colleague at UCL, has, has, has benefited enormously from medical students wanting to do the uh, 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 work with CAR T, and he's got a, a production line of them going through and producing great data. Um, and because industry is involved, he can fund and support those individuals. So I think there is benefit for everyone. I think the industry is very keen. It wishes to uh, use the UK as a test, but it can see the great science. It can see the great early translation. It's then about how does it make it easy to run a trial. And if we can educate our people as to how the, the regulatory processes in running a trial, making it easier, a surgical trial, medical trial, the industry will come and then the benefit to the medical school, the benefit to the hospital, and the benefit to the UK PLC is there. Um, I think the, we, we have an, op I think there is a window of opportunity at the moment because of Brexit. Uh, they, certainly Patrick Vallance, who is now the uh, government's chief scientific advisor, Patrick was a ex-UCL, uh, then went into the industry for, has been at GSK for a decade or so, and is now back. He has a really good understanding of the, that interaction and the need for us to interact. So I, I just wonder whether uh, uh, we need to start thinking about programs out of certain centres, very similar to what has happened with the Innovate UK centres, uh, although London might argue it felt a little aggrieved that it wasn't one of them. But uh, you know, you've got the Northern Network with Newcastle and Edinburgh, you've got the Manchester grouping with Leeds, uh, and then you've got the Midlands, Birmingham and Cardiff. But then there's the London uh, treatment centres, which is UCL, Imperial and King's, um, and opportunities for research so that we are seen from outer space and this is the place to come and develop your new technology and your new skill set. So I think it's just about just talking about it more, which we're doing, clearly, uh, making sure that we lay some foundations at all levels rather than just one particular level and hope that the intended benefit is closer to 100% rather than 0%, i.e. that you've ended up giving all these opportunities and you had no output from it. I mean, we need that end-to-end -end solution that we can talk about it as a one moment and it has an effect for two years and ten years down the line it had no effect at all, which is not what any of us want or need. But there, there needs to be more flexibility built into the system to achieve yes. this. But HEE need to be persuaded of yes. that. Yes. GMC. Well, GMC and HEE. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're all focused on, we, we ain't got enough doctors, let's yeah. have 1,500 more, which won't have an effect, as we all sadly know, <laughs> for at least 15 years. Uh, it's too late. Uh, mm. I think we are you know, really good people. Again, I can speak for haematology. A couple of years ago, six senior consultant professorial haematologists left these shores and they all went to the United States. You know, because the opportunities that were given to them there uh, were just phenomenal. Uh, and it's hard to say no. And, and I'm going to assume that that could happen in, in many other disciplines. Uh, and we want them to stay here, do their research here, benefit UK patients uh, and UK PLC, which is... I, I have been, I'd like to support them, I and mean, I've been slightly frightened in the last five to ten years from some...
extraordinarily bright trainee or research surgeons who have reached the end of their training and turn around and said, I don't want to be a practicing surgeon or I want to move or I want to go to industry. And this, in, in, this is anecdotal evidence. I don't have statistics to support it, but I'm certainly sensing a trend that some of the best people I have seen come through these rather preferred tracks are actually looking for alternatives. And, 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 and I think in order to fix the middle part, there needs to be a clear fix of the latter part of the career at the same time, because that's how you attract the best people and that's, that's how you keep them. And if, it, if the training change happens without what happens once they return to normal or clinical academic <coughs> practice changes, it's not going to be particularly effective. Both need to change at the same time. Can I, I still think though we're talking about the sort of five star, we're talking about the cutting edge research and innovators and people who are going to be headhunted from America. I think we still have a massive rump, the, the sort of three star, which is that feel very disenfranchised, and it's not just surgeons, I think it's a lot of other clinicians, who feel, who feel that all of the, many of these innovations are not for them, they don't even understand what it's about, and they form part of the barrier to implementation. And it is about, part of the role of the training is to try to, to narrow that and try to create a generation of surgeons who are going to be, and other clinicians, who are going to be more nimble and able to engage with whatever innovations are thrown at them over their careers. And I, I'm not very good at dealing with generalities, I'm more interested in specifics, and I'd be interested to know what each of you, if you could go out there to not the teaching hospital, not the big centre, but to the DGH where the surgeons are day in, day out doing this volume that is required, what would you get the, the surgeons in those centres in your own areas to do that they don't do now? What are the things they need to know about, the things they need to embrace to get these blue skies, real groundbreaking, exciting changes into real clinical practice? Um, I know there's some examples from what I do, but I'm really interested to hear about what you think would make a difference specifically in the next five to ten years. Um, yeah, kind of just before I answer, I suppose that I, I discuss, um, I work quite a lot with SMEs uh, trying to develop medical devices of various descriptions and, and exactly the same kind of feedback comes back from them that they can maybe find a clinical champion but at the point at which maybe they've got through to clinical trials and they want to expand outwards that trying to engage interest more widely is, is, is extremely challenging. Um, actually, not just SMEs, but, but, but some of the multinationals as well. And, and so therefore, a lot of the, the kind of the, the larger scale clinical trials don't take place in the, in the UK. Um, in terms of how to, how to change that, I, I don't think I necessarily talk enough with, with the kind of uh, sur surgeons that, that you're talking about. But my understanding from talking to colleagues at, at a teaching hospital is that that perhaps just the everyday pressures are so, are so much that there's not necessarily a focus on, on wanting to change from, from the, the current status or, 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 or effectively a conservative with a small c uh, approach to, to what they're doing. How to change that, I think it has to go back to, to, to the training actually to, to earlier on that I think I said that kind of trying to trying to ensure that all surgeons are at least tech savvy. <laughs> so, so it doesn't mean that they need to be an, an absolute expert in all these different fields, but can understand enough of the basics and be connected to people that are experts. And I think that's where the collaborations come well, in. To be able to mean. I mean, for me, tech is managing to make my telephone work. That's about as far as I get. I mean, in terms of, of tech, what sort of level, what sort of things are you talking about? I think maybe that depends on the, the surgical discipline, discipline a little bit. So I, so I outlined at the start a whole bunch of different technologies that I saw coming forward. And so maybe that does change depending on, on the, the speciality. Um, but, but I think across all of those, a, a better understanding of digital technologies actually is, is, is kind of kind of key, um, um, but that, but then more specifics in stem cells, for for example, or or, or, or uh, in biomechanics and in an orthopedics, so that if a technology is presented, um, a surgeon can understand um, the the evidence th that's being put in front of them to a level to which they can say, I think this is something I want to adopt or not. Uh, or if they can't, to know who to go and, to, to go and have those discussions with. Because I think that's, that's kind of part of the key is linking up 
those those surgeons with with a wider range of professionals that can that can provide advice. I I I I think the reason why I have focused on what you call the five star end is because in my mind, all UK surgeons are five star. <laughs> I don't actually see the three star surgeon. I have only met even in, in, in what I'd call non-research active or non-academically active individuals, I have only met extremely capable individuals. It's a very arduous bit of training to get there. And even the ones who've ended up not being research active, in my view, are highly capable of innovation. So, so, so that's my starting point, is that I, for, for me, the concept of the three-star UK surgeon doesn't exist. Uh, um, I think you misinterpreted that, but, but it, it, it's not the leaders, it's the... It's the the, 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 gr the ground level doers who are, as you say, completely outstandingly able, but, yeah. but don't, and how are they enabled to? But, but, so, but, but where I disagree with that premise is I think even more opportunity, some of the doers may surprise you in becoming leaders. And for me, that's the definition of good training. Is, 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 is now, you ask what technology specifically. Well, and, and we had this discussion with, with Richard the last time we spoke. I actually see. Um, um, surgeons in, in the future being a lot more, uh, their training being a lot more akin to astronauts or fighter pilots. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more in simulators. And I think, I think that virtual reality technology, which I've actually seen, I saw a, a young um, cardiovascular surgeon presented um, at, at, at a recent TED conference, was, was really surprising. I think the very first form that these new techniques will take is a, a, a simulator room in, in almost every hospital, be teaching or non-teaching, where people will be able to go in and experience what it is to do something with or without the new gizmo, whatever the new gizmo might be. I think a big part of that is going to be image guidance. I think a lot of these tools increasingly are becoming um, a, about non-invasive or image-informed decision-making. And even though I know most surgeons do receive some radiology training today, I think that is more of the video game variety that I'm talking about. So people will need to have the opportunity not only to read these images, but to actually respond and navigate within those images. And that is a new technological skill set which my six-year-old son has, but most 30, 40, 50-year-olds today do not. The second set of, of devices um, that I think they need to get familiarity with is, is this idea of, of wireless connectivity, of the ability to actually have sensors and measure things in real time, and the ability to perform real time feedback on the basis of this wireless connectivity. And the third point, which Ruth beautifully touched upon, I mean, you know, what is the point of taking every surgeon and putting them through a lab or a basic science rotation? But well, it really is to develop their scientific judgment. And I think one of the, in the same way as we want Facebook users to be completely aware of the privacy issues that come with using that technology, even if you're just a user, we want surgeons who are likely to use new technologies to have the ability and the training to understand its limitations and the clinical evidence which may or may not be supporting it. You know, I work in ultrasound. I'd like for every surgeon to know you do not bring ultrasound next to a gaseous body like the lung because very bad stuff happens. But you need to have experienced that and you need to have taught it to someone to make sure that it's there. And, and, and so the one that presented by an ultrasound device from industry, you're not relying on the quality of the regulatory or the industrial collaboration to tell you whether something is safe or unsafe. So these are the training accesses that I would see. Um, you know, image guided, wireless, evidence-based, and modality-based, and what can we understand about it? I suppose following on from that, so I think we're all touching on the fact that the innovation cycle is no longer a 25-year cycle. Uh, we're seeing things moving at five to 10 years, and I've, you know, I can say that for hematological practice, bone marrow transplantation practice, uh, we have seen transformation with some of the new therapies coming through. Uh, we, how do we create the NHS readiness. Now, I would absolutely concur that we are producing five-star surgeons. The only problem is we're placing those five-star surgeons into facilities that will not allow them to practice their five-star surgery. And uh, John Moxham, who uh, is one of the medical director of BRC at, at, at King's, who used to be one of the medical directors, used to say, what is it? We appoint fantastic people and within five years, they're dead. Yeah, the system has basically worn them down to a, 
uh, uh, sort of dust. So to, to, to facilitate or change that, we've got to change a number of things. So we, we, we will create the good people. We need to give them the opportunity within their institutions. Now, I think linkages of smaller institutions, district general institutions, very similar to the American model, which is the core center with 30 feeding institutions who use the same SOPs, the same structures, the same training opportunities, whether it's by WebEx or by uh, physical meetings. Uh, we need to persuade the, uh, the chief medical officer uh, and others that they do need to be given research time Everybody does, in my view, otherwise we will just create people who are just workhorses, hospitalists, as they coin them in the US. So there are indeed some individuals who will wish to be the hospitalist. So that's fine, that's great, we should allow that. But there are other individuals who maybe, my view is, what is the difference between an academic and an NHS consultant? The answer should be nothing, absolutely nothing that the opportunity working within as part of a team, uh, uh, either working with Imperial or UCL or KCL or Oxford or Cambridge, that opportunity needs to be there. So we need to bring the scientists closer to the clinicians and the clinicians closer to the scientists so they work together as part of a team. Uh, we need to persuade NIHR that to release that money a little bit more easily for some great projects. They seem to be quite stingy with them and one wonders uh, why, why, how, they, how and why they give them out. Um, and then we also need to educate trusts and universities that, you know, impact factor uh, journal of 50 is not the only marker of good. Uh, and that, in the current ref cycle, is the only marker of good uh, with, the, with the grant income. And, and that's not going to be feasible for a uh, a, a, a surgeon working in a, in a smaller hospital who wishes to innovate. I mean, the Institute of Improving Healthcare, when they came eight, nine years ago to, to the NHS, I was spending four or five hours with them, and they sort of said, well, innovation is happening all across the NHS. The only problem is we don't see it. There's a guy working in Hospital X who's innovating, but that person doesn't get the opportunity to go and tell anyone about it. Uh, so we need to facilitate that in all institutions. Chief executives need to be told from above that you can't have a contract that is nine sessions DCC, one SPA. That's never going to allow those individuals who've done an MD, PhD, came with great hope and then have it crushed to death uh, on, on, on the first day. Uh, NIHR need to facilitate that. We need to have structures in hospitals that facilitate research. I mean, I, I'm sure it's true in, in everybody's hospital here. I want to do this research program. Okay, now here's 5,000 pages uh, for you to fill in and then you submit it and then they say, no, you need to send this back in. And have you spoken to the HTA? Have you spoken to the MHRA? Have you spoke? And the answer is, oh my God, I, I don't know how to do that, because you never got that training as part of your program. So the idea that you could indeed facilitate that or have departments, like in the US, I come with a good idea, it's on one sheet of A4, I hand it to the team, 60 strong, and before I know it, I've got a 179 page document ready to roll. One of the fundamental challenges, if I might leap in here, is that actually the NHS want hospitals they don't want scientists, innovators. They want people who will deliver the service. I know that. They, 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 it's all well and good. They may wish that, but do we as a profession and surgeons or physicians or others, scientists, wish that as well? The answer is no, because UK government PLC wish to see innovators of the future and high-end jobs in this country. I, I, I've had this conversation with Sue Hill. So genomic centers. So colleagues in Holland have decided to send all their HLA, HLA typing for their transplant programs to the US because it's cheaper. If you speak to anyone at Imperial, UCL, or KCL, where do you send your sequencing? Oh, to Shanghai, because it's cheaper. So the idea that, uh, that, that certain components of care are just not necessarily going to have to happen here Furthermore, is robotic surgery, could it be done from China? <laughs> Have robot, 
put patient on table, surgeon in China does the operation for you, or in the US or anywhere else in the world. So we've got to start looking away from these structures and silos and be rather more open-minded. Industry will come here if we have innovation to offer, and we offer that basic science and transformation through to clinical practice and then pay them for it. And that's where obviously NICE and others are, uh, have those discussions. But we cannot assume that the simple hospital structure is, is, will necessarily have to be there because this AI and robotics can be delivered from outer space. So how do we begin to get from here to there? Because that's the challenge, isn't it? Because every step you take feels like a giant mountain to climb as you try. I'd, I'd like to make a, a, a small incremental suggestion because it, it goes back to the context of um, to the concept of lifelong learning, which I think you alluded to, which is you know you have your hospitalists. How do you encourage them to take up new techniques? And I think the easiest short-term fix is the concept of um, short periods of sabbatical leave. So, 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 you know, it exists in academia, and it exists in academia for a reason. That if you actually try to go through an entire academic career of forty years with what you learn during your PhD, you're going to be in trouble very quickly. And 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 I think you know, carefully managed training sabbaticals for surgeons would achieve two things. They would break the fatigue pattern, which I think is important in making it an attractive career but they would also enable people to go and immerse themselves in a new development in their discipline that they can then be the in-house expert in their hospital, in their non-teaching hospital, and embrace and bring into practice. Well, I think, I mean, study, study leave is a good example. If you speak to an Australian or New Zealand colleague, they get about £15,000 per annum to go to the appropriate courses because of their, the distances, of course. Uh, most study leave budgets in most trusts have been whittled down to £495, certainly for me where I am. I've never applied for one. So uh, it, it doesn't make it easy for anybody to, to, to get that appropriate uh, training. Going back to the hospitalist issue and the United States, of course, we haven't made that step yet. But you have to recertify. That doesn't mean revalidation as we have it in this country. That means that every five years, you actually have to formally take your exams again to prove that you are an appropriate surgeon, physician, or whoever you are, and to continue practicing. So that, if the innovation cycle starts to accelerate, which is indeed doing, and we keep being told that you will have three cycles of your life or job, then the, the medical profession may well have to smarten up and say, actually, we are going to have that sabbatical period, call it the revalidation process, proper revalidation process, to allow us to re-engage and to move to the next level because the change is coming at a pace, I think, in all the disciplines, not just surgical disciplines. Um, That's a, a discussion I've had before and, and the, the, the sort of counter comment goes back to the hospitalist bit in that um, if you do have to go through a, um, not just a revalidation cycle, but doing the exams again, when you run your system um, so thin where cover falls apart if someone goes off sick, the, the thought that someone may not pass their exams and they won't be able to continue, they, they can't deal with that concept. <coughs> so we do actually need a uh, I think we need a, a staff base that is actually much greater. And we're, we're talking about that already, though. For people to have time to go and do a period of sabbatical leave or whatever, there has to be some way of backfilling that to allow the service to continue. But in, in the US model of care, uh, advanced nurse practitioner, physician associates, uh, for example, in Seattle, if you, if you look at cardiothoracic surgery in Seattle, uh, some of the most highly paid individuals, not just the surgeons, but the, the associates who actually do most of the opening, closing, a lot of the routine, mundane hospital stuff, and they are not necessarily doctors. They're nurses. They're a physicist who decided to retrain. There are many, many different backgrounds and specialities. So I think, again, we need to be careful about thinking of what is the future 
uh, of, of any of the disciplines because yeah, we're appointing hell for leather uh, advanced nurse practitioners who are actually far superior, they're static, they're running the wards, uh, 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 whereas the trainees, because of the way the tra training is, is being developed, cannot be there for so more than so many hours and they're having to do shift pattern working, whereas the hospitalists, nurses and others uh, are there Monday to Friday or seven days a week between the hours of nine and six providing that service. A lot of surgery may not necessarily need to be delivered by a surgeon. I, I'd also like to convey to you a discussion um, from a few weeks ago, which is, I mean, you ask how this, this, these new initiatives might be funded or supported um, to, to, to enable current workload. I'm, I'm sure this must have been discussed at this panel, but I, I, I think private practice may actually offer a route forward. And I know there have been very varied views within the NHS system as to how much we should welcome the involvement of NHS clinicians in private practice and, 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 and views diverge. But I, I actually think there is a very good opportunity to provide people with that duality. Part of those revenues could then be used to support some of these endeavors. And I also think there's something very interesting about private practice, particularly in surgery, which is often overlooked, which I have personally experienced in some of the projects I've been involved in. Between completing a phase one or a phase three trial and a treatment being widely available, there is a lag. And, and, and actually, very often during that period, the new treatments are very often first experienced, therefore first taught and first learned in private practice. And, and from a, a UK PLC perspective, you know, I'm, I'm not a surgeon, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not part of, of, of that lifestyle and what it entails necessarily, but I think private practice offers perhaps an opportunity rather than a threat to bridging some of these training gaps um, and actually providing and filling some of those funding gaps to enable some of those schemes to exist. And I think we have to have a more open conversation about those opportunities rather than thinking NHS private practice, separate yeah. discussions. Yes, yeah, so just uh, going right back to just your, your, your thoughts on, particularly on the personalised medicine, which obviously lies um, behind many of the things we talked about. They're not entirely, some, some of the things are, more in, uh, are set in the more traditional. Um, taking whole populations of people to do things to. Um, and then there's the issue. You've got innovations in personalised medicine where the traditional way of evaluation is no longer appropriate. The concept of the randomised controlled trial is out the window. In fact, interestingly, it's, it's getting much closer, perhaps, to the sorts of evaluation appropriate in engineering. Well, you don't do randomised trials for building a bridge or something. It's a, it's a, it We're just a random trials. Uh, <laughs> your thoughts on how, you know, how is society going to be reassured and the, and the profession who want to adopt these things about their effectiveness and their cost effectiveness once we, once we, we, we move away from randomised trials? Uh, yes, I mean, it's a, uh, I can make a comment there. It's interesting to see ISA, which are the US equivalent of NICE based out of California, recently started to say uh, perhaps the p value should be changed to p equals 0 0.005 because we have a lot of stuff that's happening at the moment which is non inferiority to get something through the door and on the basis that it, it might be a little bit safer than the last product, it gets licensed and then the pressure is to use it and it's usually eye-wateringly expensive. So that's, that's, a, that's a different argument. That's the, the US finally feeling the pinch of the cost of all the things that it's doing. But from the point of view of personalized therapies rather than personalized diagnostics, and personalized diagnostics is problematic because have tool and, and, and it's absolutely true to say that if you look at personalised diagnostic tests, where it's exploding is in the private sector, not in the NHS. Uh, we're trying to control it in the NHS. It's not being controlled in the private sector. People then have information that nobody knows what it means. The patient doesn't know what it means. 
the clinician who they see doesn't know what it means because they don't have the appropriate knowledge base and there aren't any trials to support the data anyway but they have a test result. When it comes to personalized therapies and the costs, you're absolutely right, we've gone historic, the historical pathway was phase one, phase two, lovely phase three randomized in a large number of patients. Uh, and that would take seven to eight years, perhaps, to get to that point. And then if it was licensed, that was everyone was happy. And then there'd be phase four post-marketing surveillance. So now, some of the innovative therapies that are coming through, and CAR T is a good example, uh, where there are two products that are with EMA at the moment, uh, Kimrio, uh, which is a Novartis product, and uh, Yescart, which is a Kite Gilead product, both CD19 CARs. Uh, you've repurposed a T cell by genetically engineering it to have an antibody on its surface that attacks a specific antigen target that you choose it to be. Fancy engineering with lentiviral or retroviral vectors. That essentially has treated a few hundred patients and it's now been licensed at eye-watering prices of you know, $495,000 per patient uh, with the additional costs coming in at about a million dollars. So we've licensed a product that we now have the same because it's a gene therapy product and a, an ATMP, an advanced therapy medicinal product, that we have to have follow-up for 15 years. And the median follow-up in many of these trials is still only 15 months. Uh, and yet we went phase one, phase two A licensed. So we are going to have to have a lot of input and surveillance on these products. Uh, how the NHS or NICE or the government pay for it is uh, they are coming up with some very interesting concepts. Um, I'm sure everyone's aware of them, which is uh, A, one nice change of rules slightly for specialized stuff, so that quali is now between 100 and 300,000 as of last year, which suddenly opens the door to most of these products. Uh, two, um, uh, we won't be able to do it in all centers, so it goes back to the idea that there'll only be, we should only restrict it to the large institutions, partly because of the toxicity profiles and the need to have many of the other ologies associated with the delivery of these to have the necessary knowledge. And if, you, if you're going to try and get uh, the, the, the pharmacy departments, because they're ATMP, they're drugs, if you're going to get engineering departments involved or facilities departments, those are likely to be adjacent in the large institutions around the country. Um, so I think uh, it, it, we're, we're on the cusp, I believe, of a, a takeoff period for uh, these and simple, simple things that, you know, chondrocyte uh, therapy, there are two or three companies now producing that. That's the start of many, many other products, modified cellular products, which will all be ATMPs, which will all come with the need. We c at the moment, these products, for example, it's your cells, which I take from you, I then <coughs> freeze them or don't freeze them. I then ship them in one product to Amsterdam and then to the United States. With the other product, once frozen, it's shipped to the United States. Then 18 to 20 days later, it returns. And then I infuse it into a patient, but it has to go through a pharmacy and stem cell lab. And that, that's a serious infrastructure. And if one thinks that this is the boutique end of it, small volume, we haven't attained high street capacity yet at Tesco. Uh, what do we do when every surgeon's doing this in discipline X or Y, and every physician's doing it in discipline X or Y? Uh, we need to have serious infrastructure availability. And I think this is where bioengineering can solve some of these problems. Companies uh, uh, like Milteni have what's called a prodigy system. It's on the bench. GMP lab, uh, and we need to have that in hospitals. Who's going to manage that? Surgeons need to know about that, as well as everybody else. So I think it's a, a, a fascinating, interesting time. We are going to pay for it. We'll find a way, but it won't be me deciding how much they pay. It'll be some, some individuals who will come to an agreement, because the companies must make this work. Their desire is they want this product. I, I think personalized also possibly takes a, 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 a number of even more immediate and surgically familiar forms. So Andy Carr, you mentioned earlier, is just put a, you know, um, a, 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 a 3D print room 
um, and within sort of you know and they exist in, in Leeds they exist now in all major orthopedic centers so this idea that you use patient specific information to print your own implant in-house for plastic surgery for orthopedic surgery molded tailored to that patient with the right characteristics for the, that location and then over time that implant may be modified for that patient's specific immune system, for that patient's specific allergies or inflammatory reactions to those particular materials. That is really changing the way the whole care pathway is, is working because the, 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 the treating surgeon, physician, is now not only taking responsibility for delivering the care, but also for supplying the very material that underpins this care. But, but it's changing the whole notion of what we mean by evidence-based surgery in this case, or evidence-based medicine. It's no longer a probability based on a randomized mm. trial of a large sample. That, that's out the window. It's That worked. The sort of scenario you just painted worked brilliantly for that patient, and their life is transformed, and we'd all support it. Sorry. I, I would agree that the, that, that model is, is definitely changing, and 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 you're right that that um, orthopedics, the area I know about, certainly is changing as well in terms of, of being able to generate these kind of personalised products. And certainly, the regulatory bodies are trying to figure out how you how you actually regulate a device that's manufactured next to, next in a bed next to the to the patient, as opposed to in a in a well controlled environment in in a in a specific laboratory. Um, so so they're definitely things that we need to tackle, perhaps we have some engineering solutions to help that on the, um, the, the development of the evidence post-surgery anyway, in terms of better imaging um, a, a, and sensing and so on, so that we're not just reliant on looking at device failure, for example, which is a real problem in orthopaedics where you might have a device in, in situ for 20 years, but, but, but trying to predict longer term performance from shorter term outcomes and a whole range of different outcomes and things like AI might have a role in, in that as well in terms of this kind of big body of data that you might be able to collect on a patient that is always going to be slightly incomplete and, and complex. Um, but I think, so, so there's, there's other disciplines that need to be involved in that process too. But this idea of a kind of a clinical trial with a, a very specific measurement um, is, is perhaps is what well, needs to evolve. But too. we also need to recognise that some of these things don't need clinical trials in the conventional sense. I mean, I, I don't think anyone needs convincing that if you are if you have to do a facial implant for someone who's having reconstructive surgery, the the the, the outcomes between choosing between five standard sizes and and basically being able to print a supporting bone structure specifically for that person the latter is going to look a lot better. I think the I, focus I, I, there... I just, just caveat to that, 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 yes, that's true, but actually if those five sizes can be manufactured in a specific sensor to a particular standard, whereas you're off the, you're, the one that you've modelled is built next to patient, perhaps two perhaps the mechanical properties aren't the same, and so on. That's what I was moving to. That's right, so the focus was actually really now shifting not so much on, on efficacy, but rather on safety, reproducibility, biocompatibility, quality of manufacture. Um, but but I, 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 think, I think not everything that has become personalized medicine necessarily needs a randomized trial for a case to be made for it. Mm. But I mean, an exa but, but going back to this uh, uh, engineering solution, you know, the Milteni Prodigy system is a GMP lab which fits on half this table. So you inject the patient cells in and out pops out your CMV-specific CTL or your gene-modified T cell. Uh, so I think the, the engineering expertise uh, yeah, in, in medical engineering is, is, is moving towards that. And, and there, but then you still have the situation that who's going to manage that? Someone still has to manage that whole process. We may still be the users of it, but the infrastructure, the services, uh, the NHS trust, has to have that facility with physicists, probably medical engineers who are going to make sure that it runs to appropriate MHRA standards uh, and other standards. I, I think a great question to ask and uh, as a discussion point is how might personalized information inform what the surgeon does um, now and in the future? I mean, you know, so, so right now 
I think the level of personalized decision that is made by the surgeon based on particular tissue typing or, you know, whether a cancer is particularly aggressive or not is whether to operate or not to operate. Mm -hmm. But is there, are there further layers of refinement that, are, that might actually come in with these additional diagnostic and personalized tools that might guide surgeon behavior that the surgeon needs to be educated about? Um, you know, certainly, certainly in neoadjuvant um, um, sort of chemotherapy um, uh, uh, surrounding surgery, there's now increasing levels of shades of grey in terms of who you treat, who you resect, um, who is deemed non-resectable, who is deemed resectable in the patient population. So in oncology, I'm seeing a very, very um, big change. I work a lot with colorectal cancer patients, and we're seeing very rapid shifts in how those patients are managed. Can we think collectively of examples where that personalized information really is going to alter the choice of surgical technique, the type of surgery, the extent of resection? Um, and, and, and those are the things I think we should be educating young surgeons about. And, uh, and how to interact with patients to get appropriate patient choice when it comes to the consent process yeah. as well. And, 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 and the only side point I'd also make to that is that I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, neglect the huge impact that big data is about to have on medicine. We are acquiring a lot of data right now and no one knows what it means. But very soon, even if we don't, if we still don't know exactly what it means, we will be able to identify correlations mm. between this large volume of data that will statistically inform what medicine does. And, and so I think it'd be a mistake to say, let's not find out what that diagnostic information is because we don't know what to do with it. I think we should find it out, we should store it and then let Google's deep mind and the other supercomputers have a go because we never quite know what might come out. The only caveat I think I'd put to that is that we need to have it, to store it, but to store it um, accurately so that it is of value when you actually come to assess it. Because that's one of the big problems with these big databases is, is the, the quality of the information that's in there. Sue so, so asked about technology earlier, and I think this is one of the things that people find displeasing about medicine. It has become one massive paper logging exercise. Mm. And, and the question is, how can you enable these data sets to be relevant and adequately documented without surgeons, nurses, practitioners spending their entire day filling in forms and writing reports? And I think that's also, you know, perhaps a less exciting area, but an area where technology can help. Mm. Can we find very, very rapid ways of accurately entering data and relating samples to clinical outcomes to radiological images? Because these data sets are currently disparate. And a big part of the reason why they can't be used effectively is because you know we might have sample information, but we then don't know how the patient did five years down the mm -hmm. line. Because sure. it's, it was just too labor intensive to enter that data. So we don't, we don't have good and bad outcomes for this particular treatment to inform the artificial intelligence process that could drive it. But, but again, the other issue with this is that unfortunately those data sets can't interact in the current format. So we don't have a digital platform to allow us to actually uh, interrogate those data sets across the board. It's, it's changing. It's changing in every, in every hospital. Uh, I, was, I was a few weeks ago uh, at, a, at a meeting in, in, in Westminster about the, you know, the future of cancer mm -hmm. treatment. And it's interesting to see how digital pathology is now very rapidly becoming integrated with both the pharmacological and the surgical pathways for treatment. And, and, and so, so with the ability to store images digitally and data digitally and um, patient monitoring data during before and after surgery digitally, people are now coming up with intelligent ways of grouping these data sets. So I think by the time this conversation is over, that capability will be there. <laughs> um, it's 12.48, we've gone just over our time. Um, I found that a fascinating discussion. We've talked about um, uh, particularly the this, this sort of impact in how do we train people to utilize these new technologies. I'm very conscious that we haven't spent a great deal of time actually talking about the, the technologies and the impact that they're going to have on how we deliver surgery in the future. Um, uh, another area that we haven't talked about was the, uh, 
the issue of healthcare safety investigation that was um, brought up in the in the engineering submission, which I think is we have a lot to learn in medicine uh, in terms of how do we make assessments a, a learning and supporting rather than a punitive um, culture, which is what we currently have. Uh, but I think these are things that we're going to have to um, try to pick up from, from the literature and from uh, written submissions. Thank you very much. I'm grateful to you. It's been fascinating. Um, uh, if there are issues that we come up with, we hopefully will be able to come back to you with some specific thoughts and, and questions if, if you're